by uh, Kerry Woodruff. He's currently a PhD candidate student at the University of Toronto, of Toronto, Canada. He also juggles that with being the director of the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum in Malta, um, Montana, where a lot of us have done work adjacent to the lands that Kerry works on. So we're a very large research group that overlap in our interests. Kerry has multiple research interests, although the sauropods, which we'll be talking about today, are near and dear to his heart. His PhD is actually on uh, pachycephalosaurus. I was hoping he was going to wear his big, heavy buffalo jacket today, but I guess not. So where is Kerry? Somewhere? I think he went to up Kerry, you're on. <laughs> so meanwhile, I'll do a song and dance for a moment. Um, for those of you who are uh, not with, did not see Danielle Defoe's talk this morning, she is assigned the illustrator for Zool, the dinosaur that the Victoria Arbor just presented. We did produce a small number of um, handouts featuring uh, an image that Danielle did. And if you can catch Danielle and or Victoria, they can give you one of these and they'll be happy to sign it as well. So without further ado, our wayward speaker, Kerry Woodruff, is here to tell us all about Apocanthosaurus. Thanks very much, Kerry. All right, so good afternoon. Thank you for coming out today. And of course, I'm here to talk about all about Apocanthosaurus. And Apocanthosaurus belongs to a group of dinosaurs that we call the sauropods. And these are the long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs. And of course, they're some of our most classic and iconic of all dinosaurs, and their image graces numerous forms of popular social and cultural media, such as a sauropod being the logo for Sinclair Oil, to of course Littlefoot from The Land Before Time, a, star, uh, excuse me, a sauropod even sneaking into Star Wars, and of course, long before Mickey Mouse, Walt Disney's very first animation was of Gertie the dinosaur, and Gertie was a sauropod. And sauropods really represent some of our most classic of all dinosaurs because of their <coughs> immense size. Sauropods were hands down the largest land animals that have ever lived on Earth. Now the numbers are a bit debated, but we estimate that our biggest sauropods were at least 120 feet long. So that's longer than whales even. But whales were heavier, so at least they can still hold the record for being the fattest animals on. <laughs> And of course, it's really this sense of scale, the sense of size that so many avenues of sauropod research are dedicated to. So for instance, when you're an animal that's 120 feet long, how much food do you have to eat each day? When you have a neck that's 40 feet long, how do you breathe in and out without passing out between breaths? Even though you get to be 120 feet long, you start out life hatching from an egg the size of a cantaloupe. So how long does it take you to grow from a cantaloupe to 120 feet long? And of course, when you are that big, how do your bones and muscles have to be designed so that way you can even move and support your own gigantic size in the first place? And so there are lots of really cool and neat avenues of research. And of course, new questions we're always trying to learn and ask about sauropods. And of course, from a museum exhibit standpoint, sauropods are the quintessential way to express the sense of scale and size of dinosaurs. So of course, you know, during the academic year, I'm up at the Royal Ontario Museum, where Dr. Victoria Harbour and of course Danielle Dufault are at, and we have our own sauropod, uh, you know, the, bar the, the Barosaurus, called Gordo. And of course, here at the Cleveland Museum, there is the Haplocanthosaurus called Happy, which I'll be talking about today. And sauropods really represent a great way, again, to convey that sense of scale. Of course, if a museum is ever looking to fill a big space quickly, you can do it real easy with a sauropod. I do want to take a moment, though, and I thought this was great, to point out the names. Um, so between the, the great sister scientific relationship between the, the Royal Ontario Museum and the Cleveland Museum here, it's great, you know, Dr. Michael Ryan talked about all the field work, but we also have a relationship with our sauropods. So between the ROM and the Cleveland Museum, we have fat and happy. Uh, so two sauropods coming together. We really should do like some sort of fun story about the two of them together. Uh, but the sauropod here, Haplocanthosaurus, is an incredibly special and very significant dinosaur. Uh, so this Haplocanthosaurus is called Haplocanthosaurus delphi, and it was named in 1988 by two paleontologists, Jack McIntosh and Michael Williams. Now, quite often, when we're giving dinosaurs new names, 
we describe something about their anatomy, so the way they look or the shape of their bones. And the name Applicanthosaurus means simple spine lizard. And that second part of the name, Delsi, is named in honor of a gentleman named Edwin Delfs. And Haplocanthosaurus is, like my title suggests, really kind of a ghost. Um, it lived during the latest Jurassic Morris formation. So that's a unit of rock that's about 150 million years old. So they're some of the oldest dinosaurs that we really studied extensively in North America. So the Morris formation is also a giant geologic formation. So north to the south, it stretches from the Canadian to the Mexican border, and east to west from Oklahoma to New Mexico. And it's been studied extensively and heavily every year since the late 1800s. Of course, this is where our famed dinosaurs like Brontosaurus and Allosaurus and Stegosaurus come from. So Haplocanthosaurus got to live alongside some of these really famous dinosaurs as well. But let's break down this information here in a little bit more detail to try to understand more about Haplocanthosaurus. So what does the simple spine mean in Haplocanthosaurus? Well, if we look at the bones that make up the neck of other sauropods that lived in the Morrison formation, like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus, and we see those on the upper far right of the image, they have these really deep V-split spines in their vertebrae. But, as circled in red, Haplocanthosaurus didn't, so it had a simple spine compared to the other sauropods living alongside of it. And the two gentlemen who named Haplocanthosaurus delsi, the first is Jack McIntosh. And Jack was an absolutely legendary force of sauropod paleontology. Uh, Jack was the expert of all things sauropod related. Jack was the guy, of course, not only naming Haplocanthosaurus delsi, he was the one who originally determined that Brontosaurus was not a real dinosaur, which is a cool story in and of itself. And even though Jack sadly passed away a few years ago, many people still consider him the preeminent expert on sauropods. And any of us sauropod experts in the world, when you ask us who is the expert or who shaped us the most in the work we're doing, we'll all tell you it was Jack. And the second person who described this specimen is Michael Williams who was a former vertebrate curator here at Paleo Curator uh, here at the Cleveland Museum. And the person who was named in honor of Edwin Delfs, and Edwin was an undergraduate student who led the dig. So I put extra uh, emphasis on undergraduate for, because for those of you who may or may not know, it takes a lot of people to dig up a dinosaur. And so normally when we go out during the summers, we take college undergraduate students with us. And Undergraduates are kind of the, uh, the slave labor of field camps. They, you know, they're coming out, sometimes it's for credit, uh, volunteer, or work experience, and they're doing all the heavy lifting and the hard work, and we really appreciate them. And of course, I started out digging as an undergrad, so I know, I know the abuse I put my own undergrads through, because I am good. Um, and of course, we always thank the people who help us out. So when we write up our findings in a scientific paper, we'll thank Oh, thanks to the 2017 uh, field season. But we rarely thank individual undergraduate students. But this is a really special case because not only was young, young Edwin leading the dig, but also this dinosaur that he found was named in honor of him. So a really great achievement in the world. And a little bit of happy history for you, for happy the Haplocanthosaurus. In uh, 1954, the Cleveland Museum decided that they wanted a big dinosaur to mount. Of course, why wouldn't they want an awesome cool sauropod? They originally started near Vernal, Utah. This is really important because Vernal is home to Dinosaur National Monument. And Dinosaur National Monument is home to some of the best, most beautiful, most complete sauropods that have ever been found anywhere in the world. So the museum thought, hey, all of these amazing sauropods have been found in this area. If we go to a similar area, maybe we'll have some luck. And sadly, they didn't. But while they were exploring around, they bumped into some geology students from Louisiana State University. And the students said, yeah, we saw it. We just came from Colorado, and we saw some bones. You should check out. And so they went down. They packed up, and they went down to outside of Canyon City, Colorado. And they found this site on the bank of Four Mile Creek. Now, what's really cool with this is because of actually, this was after World War II, but because of a lot of the history of World War II, there was a lot of interest in uranium and uranium exploration. And many 
Dinosaur sites we know of today, the Morrison Formation, were found because of looking for uranium. And so because of this hunt for uranium, they actually had to file a mining claim before they dug. So Ed Delfs goes into the local office to file a personal mining claim. And I think this is a really cool part of the story because Ed, since he had the mining claim, those bones would have belonged to him. So he donated, would have donated them to the museum. But it would, need, it would be neat to be able to go back and find even a copy of the actual mining claim certificate for this. And so they found the bones and they went back over the course of three seasons and this is what they found. Now, this is what we call a quarry map. So when we're digging up dinosaurs, we make this map that shows where all the bones are in relation to one another. And basically what we have is a couple bones in the neck, but mostly parts of the back, parts of the hips and legs, and a chunk of the tail. Now, this is an original picture published in the de description that Jack McIntosh uh, published. And it's kind of hard to see because it's black and white, but you know, the site is right on the road. You can see a parking lot for cars. And kind of in the left-hand side of the picture, you can see the crew working. And it looks like it's this tiny little creek and really kind of quaint and picturesque. But it was actually really hard digging. So the layer of rock where the, the dinosaur was, was sandwiched in between two really hard layers of rock. So they literally had to mine in to the hillside. And they had to shore up, of course, these hard layers because that way it wouldn't cave in on them. And as the picture on the top left shows, there's a little four mile creek. But anyone who's been out west, especially out west in the summer knows that out west they get sudden massive thunderstorms and rains and they can suddenly flood what had been a seemingly dry area. And so here at the bottom is, it's a, a blurry photo in color, but there's Four Mile Creek when it is flooded. And the quarry periodically got flooded. And even in the original description, they say that luckily only a minimal number of bones were washed away. So it was kind of an interesting dig in and of itself. So of course on the left hand image here from the paper, here is the crew of uh, young undergraduate students mining in into this softer layer between the two hard layers. And so once they excavated the bones, they make what we call a jacket. That's the same thing as a cast for a broken bone. And so they would take these jackets and drag them or ferry them across Four Mile Creek. And of course you can even go to the site today and see it, which is really cool. So this was a picture when the sign uh, it was put up and dedicated. And of course here's Jack McIntosh and Michael Williams, and of course Ed Delfs all grown up. What's really cool is you can go and see this today, and you may get someone in the back may be able to not, may not be able to make it out, but the sign even says the Cleveland Quarry. So it'll always have that relation to the Cleveland Museum. So once the bones were brought back to the museum here and cleaned, the skeleton was actually originally mounted laying down, as if the animal were laying down. And it wasn't until 1963 that it was mounted in a standing posture. And so since 1963, Haplocanthosaurus has really stood as, I would say, an absolute crown jewel of the dinosaur gallery. And so think about the time frame we've talked about. It's dug up in the 50s, mounted as is in the 60s, and, but it's not until the late 80s that the scientific paper describing it comes out. And so Haplocanthosaurus, we, this specimen here, Happy, we've known about it, the world's known about it for a long time. And you would think that we'd know a lot about the animal because we potentially had so long to look at it. But that's actually not true. And so that begs the question, what do we actually know about Haplocanthosaurus? Well, unlike Haplocanthosaurus, many of the other sauropods from the Morrison Formation, like the Patasaurus or the Plodocus or Camerosaurus or Brachiosaurus, we either have beautifully, largely complete single skeletons, or since we've been collecting in the Morrison Formation for so long, we have enough bits and pieces from different animals that we know what all of the different regions of the skeleton look like. But that's not the case in Haplocanthosaurus. We only have these few glimpses of this part or that part. Now, what complicates our understanding of Haplocanthosaurus in part is that we have two species. So there's Haplocanthosaurus delsi, so that's happy here. And in the image in the left, again, that's basically what we know of happy, those blue-gray bones. A few bones in the neck, part of the back, part of the hips and legs, and a bit of the tail. But what, what adds to our complication is there's a second species, 
Haplocanthosaurus parisis, and that was actually the very first species of Haplocanthosaurus named. Now, this animal is smaller than a happy, but what's really interesting is it was found on the exact same creek, just on the opposite side as happy was found. And we see from Haplocanthosaurus parisis, we have part of the hips, a few more bones in the neck, part of the back, and part of the tail. But we're still missing all of the, you know, what the shoulders would have looked like, all of the legs, all of the front limbs, the skull, the whole neck or the whole tail. So there's, again, these piecemeal bits we have in trying to picture what this animal would look like. However, what we can say from those, even with those big holes missing, is that Haplocanthosaurus was one of the smaller sauropods of the Morrison Formation. So Haplocanthosaurus is on the far left in red, and its body size compared to some of the other sauropods in the Morrison Formation. And the length is debated, but people estimate you know, Haplocanthosaurus' average body size was about 59 to 60 some odd feet long. And the animal was about 25,000 pounds. Now that's still a big animal, but it's just, relatively speaking, smaller than the other sauropods that lived alongside. And these, again, these missing holes really complicate our ideas of trying to understand where Haplocanthosaurus fits on the sauropod family tree. Um, oh, that's it got moved, I'm sorry. Um, we'll talk about the family tree next. Uh, one of the really neat things, though, with Haplocanthosaurus and understanding the rock records is when we look at the layers of rock, we talk about stratigraphy. So from a geologic standpoint, the oldest rocks are on the bottom and younger rocks are laid on top. And if we look at the layers of rock in the Morrison Formation, we see that Apatosaurus and Diplodocus really come from the upper half of the Morrison Formation. But Haplocanthosaurus is restricted to the lower half of the Morrison Formation. So learning more about Haplocanthosaurus could tell us maybe how the sauropods in the Morrison Formation evolved in the first place, evolved later than without in the formation. So here we get the family tree. Um, I don't want you to know the details of the family tree, but Haplocanthosaurus is circled in red. And so basically, some analyses said that it was more closely related to Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus than Diplodocus or Apatosaurus. Some said it was somewhere between those, all those different sauropods, and some said it was more primitive than them. Another analysis, looking at the tree on the top left, said that everywhere where those drawings of Haplocanthosaurus are, said basically every one of those positions were places on the family tree where it made sense. So basically, Haplocanthosaurus made sense to belong anywhere in the family tree. And it really was for a long time trying to figure out where Haplocanthosaurus fit on the sauropod family tree, analogous to throwing darts. Every analysis hit a, a different place and said it belonged somewhere else. So we really didn't know where it fit in the family tree. Now, as our methods for understanding dinosaur relationships, evolutionary relationships, and family trees has gotten better and better over the years, a general agreement is that Haplocanthosaurus is more closely related to Apatosaurus and Diplodocus, and that's the group that is marked within this red triangle. But it's really, really what we, you know, we would you know, informally consider as being a primitive member of this group. So again, think back to the stratigraphy, the rock record. Haplocanthosaurus not only occurs earlier than Apatosaurus and Diplodocus, but it's also related to them. So understanding more about Haplocanthosaurus could also help us understand how Apatosaurus and Diplodocus evolved. And something that had always kind of interested me about Haplocanthosaurus is why does it have, why does it have that simple spine? Because again, Haplocanthosaurus, with the red circle on the left, has a rounded spine compared to Apatosaurus and Diplodocus that have that deep V-split spine. However, if we go back and actually look at Haplocanthosaurus, especially the specimen that that drawing on the left was drawn from, it actually doesn't have a rounded spine. Now, it's not a deep V-shaped split spine that Apatosaurus and Diplodocus have. It's a shallow, slightly notched little spine. But again, understanding this evolutionary relationship Haplocanthosaurus can help us understand why Apatosaurus and Diplodocus evolved these deep split spines in the first place. And a really interesting question people have wondered about Haplocanthosaurus is how old could it be? And what we mean by that is 
If you actually looked at the animal from the day it was, you know, hatched out of the egg to the day it died, how old could the animal itself be? And how we actually determine the age of a dinosaur is we actually take a section of its bone out. We you know, remove a section, we make a microscopic slide of it, so we grind it until it's thin enough for light to pass through it. And just like any of y'all have seen a tree cut down, and you look at the stump and you can see the lines, and you count the lines to tell how old the tree is, we can do the exact same thing with dinosaur bones. Now, we haven't done it for all the sauropods in the Morrison formation, but when we look at Camarasaurus, we estimate that it took about 35 years for a Camarasaurus to grow up. And Diplodocus took about 24 years for it to grow up. And this is really interesting because in the past, a long time ago, paleontologists thought that big animals were old animals and small animals were young. So paleontologists had thought that really big dinosaurs had to be really old and the opposite. But we see there's actually no true correlation between size and age. So even though Diplodocus is longer than Camarasaurus, it grew up faster. So how old could Haplocanthosaurus be? We don't know. Could have been younger, could have been older. And in fact, no one has ever analyzed Haplocanthosaurus to determine how old it would be. So that would be a really neat project to do. And something I always found really odd about Haplocanthosaurus were its legs. So if you look at the legs of a Patasaurus and Diplodocus, and you look at, and this is the hind legs, and so you look at the proportion of the femur, which is shown with the red line, in relation to the shin, so the bones in the shin, the tibia, the fibula, you see that in the Diplodocus and the Patasaurus, they're roughly similar. By the Haplocanthosaurus, the femur is crazy long, way longer than the lower part of the leg. And so if we looked at the femur scaled in green, and we look at this scale, Haplocanthosaurus still has a ridiculously tiny shin, no matter how you scale it. So what's going on with these weird proportioned legs? Well, when we study animals today, because a lot of times understand dinosaurs, because they were animals that just lived a long time ago, we study animals today to try to learn more about how animals in the past may have moved, acted, behaved, etc., etc. And we noted a correlation between animals like rhinos and bison and those things that are real bulky, heavy animals, the bones in the hind limbs are roughly equal. But if we look at animals that are really fast and agile and mobile and running around, one of the bones in the leg is significantly longer. I want to stop everyone here and I want to say, I am not saying that I think Haplocanthosaurus was some sort of speed demon running around the Morrison formation. It has those weird proportions, but maybe not. There is another animal alive today that has a oddly proportioned hind limb, where the femur, the upper bone in the leg, is significantly longer than the bones of the shin, just like we see in Haplocanthosaurus. And that's the elephant. Now, elephant skeletons are marvelous, marvelously designed to do what they're designed for. And being able to support a great weight, move a great weight, they're just fascinating feats of engineering. But one thing elephants do really well, and do a lot of, that y'all may not be aware of, is they walk, and they walk a lot. So elephants migrate all across Africa. So when we see like any of these great Attenborough documentaries with great migrations, we always see elephants featured in there. So they don't only really migrate for food, they migrate, you know, to find water and other resources. So maybe the proportions of the elephant and why they have those proportions could be similar in Haplocanthosaurus. It's just a theory, mind you, but maybe Haplocanthosaurus was having to migrate all across the Morrison Formation. Maybe the kinds of plants it, were, it was eating were really different than the other sauropods or that lived alongside of it. Maybe that's another reason why it's so rare, because it has to travel, you know, its resources are rare, and it has to travel greater distances to find them. Who knows? But it may just be one possible explanation to explain the funny proportions of the legs. Now, as we work more and more in the Morrison Formation, we have been finding more specimens of Haplocanthosaurus, but most of them are from Colorado. So there's a beautiful specimen indicated by a largely complete lower leg that was found in Colorado, that was found by the Science Museum of Minnesota. There's a not so pretty specimen, again found in Colorado, that's at the Museum of Western Colorado. And a really neat specimen that was actually found in Montana, so way far away from every other Haplocanthosaurus, it's also hands down the biggest Haplocanthosaurus that's ever been found. 
Now, sadly, this specimen wasn't found by a museum. It's actually found by uh, individuals who have it for sale. So we really hope that one day this specimen goes to a museum because it would tell us a lot more about Apocanthosaurus. But the crown jewel of the new specimens is this one, which ironically was found in Vernal, Utah, where the Cleveland Museum started their hunt for a sauropod. Now, we couldn't get all of this in the picture, but remember, I've been saying Apocanthosaurus is like a ghost. We only have these few bits and pieces of its skeleton to try to say what the animal looked like. Now, we still don't have a skull, but here is most of a neck, most of a back, the, the hips, most of the tail, most of the rib cage, most of the hind legs, and for the first time, the whole front legs. And so this specimen will really help fill in a lot of the missing pieces and help complete that picture that we have. But none of these new specimens take away from the power and significance of Happy here at the museum. Anyone working on sauropods has to study happy and come here to do so. Any of these other analyses that are trying to describe new haplocanthosaurus specimens have to come here to describe happy. So happy isn't just some, a space filler of the museum. It's not just something to look up at and go, ooh, it's big. Happy is also, it's an amazing specimen. It's a crown jewel of the dinosaur pattern, and it's an incredibly important you know, paleontological reference point, and it will always serve as that, re as that important reference point. It also, in case anyone was ever curious, serves as, of course, the inspiration for the logo, the mascot behind the museum, and, of course, has to be the inspiration for what has to be the best-named science-based podcast out there. <laughs> and so, I hope y'all have really learned a lot more about Happy today, and really appreciating this great, you know, part of the collection as this crown jewel. And you should all really be proud of this. The fact that it's still also the only mounted haplocanthosaurus in the world and still is absolute crown jewel of a sauropod specimen. So thank you very much, and there should be time for questions.